Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar today. Today we're going to be discussing the increasing role that automation is playing in the credit and collections arena and how it has never been uh, more important. Traditional channels like the phone, letter and email are still heavily re relied upon in, in the industry, but I think it's safe to say that the tide is definitely turning as more and more collections team, teams are introducing messaging, the likes of SMS and WhatsApp um, to connect with their customers. So today we will look at how to marry messaging channels with automation to effectively connect with more customers, better manage those conver collections conversations, take payments and ultimately increase cash flow. So just before we start, just a reminder that if you have any questions, please use the question pane in your control panel. And um, as always, we will endeavour to get back to all of them. But in the event that we run out of time, uh, don't worry, we'll be happy to get back to you um, after the event here. So now let me introduce you to our presenters today. For those of you who have been on, a pre on previous sessions, um, you will have met and know uh, Graeme Bragg, um, Mark Opperman and Delia Jones, all from Webio here, who have been instrumental in what I like to say, uh, supercharging customer engagement for all of our clients. So um, hello, Graeme, Delia and Mark. Hi, Anne-Marie, thank you. Hi, Anne-Marie. So um, as Anne-Marie said, uh, the whole area of sort of automation and conversational uh, messaging is really sort of starting to become uh, the norm. And um, what we're going to do today is focus in on the automation piece and really touch on um, what uh, is happening in the marketplace. Uh, and really just to give you a sort of a bit of a backdrop of some of the companies that we work for, um, all are very heavily focused in credit collections and payments. And if I was to break it down into three industries, you could say it's financial services, retail and utilities. But again, that um, super tight focus on credit collections and uh, payments. So again, we're gonna bring a lot of what actually is working in the marketplace. We're gonna share some of that uh, with you today and what's perceived as best practice. So um, the agenda today is, um, as I mentioned, about automation. Um, and really, um, you know, why should you be doing it? Where are the places to get started? Um, you know, what should you expect as, uh, say, an easy win? Um, and then really sort of, Building on that would be sort of how you can build bots um, to do the automation and what does it actually mean? And then sort of the success and uh, I'm going to say failure, we're going to deal with that uh, shortly, but how the whole sort of process is managed and in many regards, how it's very easy for you to do this. This is not an area for you to be concerned about. Um, it is actually probably a lot easier than you think. And then finally, we're gonna have uh, some uh, takeaways. Uh, not of the food variety, very much though, a couple of points and um, a summary on what uh, we've covered uh, during the day. Okay, so let's get started. Um, automation, um, and this is an area where there is the potential for people to get very confused. There is um, so much stuff, uh, so many sort of PR pieces, so many emails that you get, your Google alerts, machine learning, AI, RPA, um, the list goes on and on. I won't even go in because we'll be here for quite a while. But really, um, what we're trying to say to people is that actually it can be quite easy um, if you just keep it simple. And really keeping it simple would be understanding the reason why you're looking to automate. Don't get caught up on the, um, the clever, say, technology. Look at what's the business benefit that you should be getting. And really, which means to you, which means to the business. So focus, I would suggest, on the business benefit. It could be one of a number uh, of them. Again, I've just got a couple of examples there. And really all that we're using there is from uh, when we engage with our customers, we wouldn't typically be talking about technology first off. It's again about what are they hoping to achieve in the business? What's the job to be done? And then really automation should only come at that stage. Don't be focusing on the technology first because actually that's the wrong approach uh, we would suggest uh, to you. So there's many different things um, automation could do for you. Um, but uh, it's a case of where, um, you know, every, every business, everybody is going to be different. Um, but what we'd like to do um, before we move on is really sort of ground the conversation in um, the real world. 
Graham, um, I'd like you to sort of take over from here. And really, could you share a couple of the automation successes our clients have and maybe sort of give a, a bit of an overview of the type of client and the application so uh, you could have, um, we can all have a bit more context of what the, actually the metrics mean. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting area. Everyone tends to do it slightly differently. They tend to focus on things that are more painful for them. But there are some sort of obvious wins and some very quick wins you can get that are more generic. Um, I'm going to cover one off the first one, which is sort of a fairly generic one. And it's been a huge power piece um, sort of post COVID, really. Um, people and, and most of you will still run some form of dialer um, using the telephone to reach out to their clients, trying to get your right party connects, you know, meet all the rules regarding, you know, non-silence sort of messaging and there's, there's hundreds of them now and it gets more and more complex um because of a lot of that people sort of thought hey, what we'll try and do we'll try and actually push our messaging through the digital channels a little bit heavier and um what we've seen is as it says there three times more engagement three times more people are coming back to those messages and that's across the board so you can start at the simple side of things say well, you know what we do sort of quite delinquent accounts and 90 day pluses um you know yes of course your your volumes will be down but they'll be down on the on the dialer what we're seeing is a lot of those people weren't responding through two, the two main reasons really one the embarrassment level at that point they're actually happy to engage uh, through a digital channel it's not a voice to voice a person to person it takes that personality sort of insight away from it uh, and secondly they can do it in their own time it hasn't got to be right party connect because that person is there it goes to their device they pick it up when they're ready they respond to it when they're ready you're going to get a lot of abusive stuff come back that is the right party connect and there are ways using automation to obviously get the most out of it as well but th what we're seeing is three times more engagement it's, it's hugely powerful so just moving on to slide um, section two there. Basically, what we're seeing again is, is how quickly people are getting to that. And if you're doing simple things like basic triage, so this is where this three times more engagement comes in. You're hitting them with an outbound message and saying, hey, you know, um, so let's use my name here. Hi, Graham. It's sounds so company. We've noticed you missed a few payments, etc. You put it in a nice way using really good neural linguistics really, that make people understand it's, you know, it's for them. It's quite friendly. I probably should respond to it. Again, it's the way you ask. And what we're seeing is by doing simple things like that to get engagement and also things like IDNV. Most conversations before any personal information is ever handed out is going to have to go through IDNV. Again, quite a hefty piece really for the agents to do. Go through, check it against the system, make sure it's OK. So even before they've got into a conversation, they've got to have gone through this process. One thing that the bots and the digital channels are very good at is doing those things automatically within the process. And the, the metric there is, you know, generally within three months of, of starting from scratch, doing your basics and working through and learning what you as a business do, within three months, we're getting about 40 percent automation on everything that you're doing across your communications platforms. So it's it's very, very powerful, very, very quick. The last one's a really great win. Um, it's one we wasn't um, sort of 100 percent sure when we first did it. We hadn't worked on this area before. But it's a company we work with a collections business and they have. Lots of people on the road. So they have field agents, really. They do a lot by, by telephone. They were doing some by SMS. That was mainly one way, just nudging people, pushing them to call a number. Um, but a lot of it was agent based. So they weren't getting anywhere with that sort of standard dialer stroke SMS process. They would then get an agent to go out and call on the, on the customer and try and help them out. Whether that was a new plan, set up a new sort of continuous payment plan, whatever it really was. Um, so we looked at that and we thought, well, where could we automate that? How could we really help? And um, by putting some simple automation in that would reach out to the customer the day before and also the morning before the agent was due to call using that using some form of basic idmv to say look you know you haven't come up you missed a few is there any changes here making it easy graphical screens clicks and, and sliders and whatever else and what we what we saw very quickly was that they could actually get 42 percent of all the payments and the people to self-serve so reaching out and saying, hey, look, you missed your payments. John is in the area. He will call and try and help you. That was a bit of a nudge. Of course, it's, oh, I probably wouldn't want John around my house and calling on me again. Not that he's a nasty guy. He's doing his job properly. But again, if they can self-serve at that point, it's that nudge to do it and making it simple, working through a simple sort of A to B to C approach, save them 42% of the calls that they were making. And that on the field agent resource is absolutely huge. Just actually on, on that, Graham, um, it was only actually on a call this week talking exactly about this with a uh, one of our, our customers and the <coughs> excuse me, the the analysis that they did on the engagement, on the automation 
um, they were estimating that um, they when and when they get back to the new norm, whatever the new norm is, um, the quote that I was given was, we won't see, we won't be doing, um, a, you know, the same volume using the dialer. It will be down as low as 25 to 30 percent of what we previously yep. did, Absolutely. going on what they've learned. So I think actually it's a, it's a really um, sort of um, the what's happened over the past um, three, four months has certainly accelerated a lot of people's thinking in this area. It definitely has. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the COVID thing coming along has certainly made people have to do things in a different way. And they've tried some new things. You know, it was very hard to have a, you know, a call center with people sitting on a on a standard line that got distributed out. Now, yes, there's ways to, to fix that. And some some companies went through a, a whole process to try and make that happen. So the home became the desk. But actually, they, they needed to look at new ways of doing it. And using SMS, using WhatsApp and those sort of those sort of channels, um, they suddenly learned that. <laughs> With a lot less effort, they were getting a lot more gain. And um, yeah. I've I've sat on a number of meetings now with, with some very senior board people at some of the larger companies we deal with, and they basically said, you know, "Why are we still using a dialer? We need to really evaluate how we change things." And that, as you say, sort of cutting down to 25% or less is, is the sort of mm -hmm. general tone I'm hearing. Indeed. So um, it just you know great. Uh, that's where that's why you should be doing it. Um, but I think really, um, you know, where to start and uh, Graham, uh, where to start? I think most people start at the uh, identification and verification. That's a fairly common starting point for everybody. It is one of the first things we automate. It's one of the obvious ones because what you're trying to do with automation is to try and take away the heavy lifting and the repetitive tasks. And one of the most repetitive tasks, nearly every conversation you have, the customer's going to have to be identified and verified. But it's one of the early ones that we pick up on with probably 90% of all our clients. And we automate that as quickly as we can. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a huge win. You know, you're taking away, you know, maybe two to three minutes of, of what was a telephone call and you know, three or four manual exchanges that would have been done through an agent through the SMS two-way conversational processes or whatever it was that they were using. So yeah, rather than us just talking about it, I think seeing is believing. Uh, Delia, uh, if I could ask you to come in at this stage, if you want to share your screen and um, what you're going to do, uh, I believe, is show us how um, a, a bot is built and how ID and Vs are going to be handled. And really just to show you, I, I'm, I'm going to say really the, the relative ease of how this can be set up and where to start. Yeah, thank you, Mark. So, yeah, in true Blue Peter style, I have a bot that I've um, prepared here earlier for you today to just give you a flavor of the ID and V and um, how easy that is to not only to build, but also to configure to your business, your business requirements and the compliance needs that you have. So typically people will ID and V on date of birth and postcode. You can also ID and V on things such as house number. You can um, do it on first line of address. It's really down to what your business need is and you can build up multiple ID and Vs as well. So this is a very simple bot. It took me two minutes to build it earlier. And um, this one is just taking through. So the first step is using um, some actual language understanding, just seeing if they want to talk. So it's just trying to engage them. And then as soon as that client is engaged, it will put them through and take them through to a an ID and V step. So this one is um, quite straightforward. It's giving them an example, telling them the format that you want it back in. Now with ID and Vs, Typically, clients want to be quite controlled in what they will accept as a successful IDMV match. And so what you can do here is provide the exact formats that you want to accept that date of birth in. And um, you can provide as many of those as you want to. And as that response comes in, the um, Webio bot will go through and it will check it against each of those formats. If it gets a successful match, it will move it along in the journey. And if it doesn't, you can build your error handling in there as well. So. Um, if we look here, Delia, while you're doing that, um, uh, the data birth formats, how many normally do clients uh, have? It's, it's always more than one, is it not? It's Some clients go with just one. So it will say, you'd give an example up here, so your six digit date of birth, um, mm -hmm. and you'd give them an example of how you wanted that to be displayed. Some clients will just go with one. We have other clients that have gone with five or six different formats that they're willing to accept. So it really just depends on um, what your compliance is happy to accept 
and which formats you want to match against. Okay, thanks. No problem. So when if the person stays on the happy path and they give you the, the date of birth back in a format that matches, you can put them down through the path that you want them to go to. So this one is very straightforward. It's just doing the IDMV and putting that then through into an agent queue for the agent to manage. However, you will have some people that go down the, um, they send in an incorrect date of birth or a date of birth that doesn't match. So what you can do very easily with the WebEO system then is building some error handling, which allows you to go back out to that client, tell them why it doesn't match, um, ask them to, to send it in again. You can give them a different example here if you want. And again, just, just build that in so it matches against those formats and takes them to the path. Now, what you might do and what a lot of our clients do when they first go live is you'll be looking at this bot fairly regularly and thinking, right, it doesn't quite work here. So you can see in this one, in the second example, at the point of this bot being built, there wasn't a further example put in. So you might see actually not many people are getting it right in that second attempt. So you can come in here very quickly and just um, put in another example, change this text and enable yourselves to iterate and try new things very, very quickly. So I can add in another example here by just very quickly typing in what I want that to be. Um, so I'll say, for example, if you were born on the 21st of March, 1974, then send 210374. And as quickly as I can do that and update my bot, the bot's now ready to go live. So it is a really, really fast configurable system that you can um, look at the data, look at the responses that are coming in from customers, see what isn't working and um, iterate and change as quickly as you need to and really get those efficiencies. So the place you are with the, the IDMV when you go live will do that sort of basic matching and then based on the customer's responses, you can then start to enhance and improve that. And Delia, um, we've talked about, uh, and I uh, used the inverted commas, failure earlier. So if the automation isn't um, sort of, you, you mentioned the happy part, um, failure doesn't really mean failure in what our, our common conception of that. Um, it just means that it, it's, um, it would be handed over to an agent. Is that correct? Um, it actually, it can be whatever you want it to be. So it's a failure in as much as the data hasn't matched, but from the customer mm -hmm. experience, that's all down to how you want to design it. So you can design that path. And actually a lot of our clients wouldn't look at that as a failure. They'll look at it as sort of an opportunity to continue that conversation. So you have the opportunity to let the bot try and get that data again. And if it still doesn't match, you can pass that over to an agent. And a lot of times we would recommend you do that to ensure that the customer experience remains at that high standard but you can also take it down another sort of automated journey if that's appropriate where you are perhaps signposting the customer to different places or um, providing them with additional information so it's it's very much based on what you're trying to achieve so really simple um to build um now you did say two minutes um for us mere mortals um how quickly roughly would most people take for building their first, um, let's say, bot that incorporates uh, an identification and verification? So if you were to set aside um, sort of an hour, that would enable you time to, to build the bot, to set up the IDMV as, as you've seen in that bot there, and also mm -hmm. to have the most important part, which is your testing. So you would be testing it to make sure that everything works as expected, um, obviously before you put any live customer data in. So to build the bot for your first time, you'd set aside about 30 minutes and about 30 minutes for testing. So I'd say, just to start quick on dealing the data that's checking against, just probably good to understand um, where that data data sits and obviously where it's checking from. So again, that's um, dependent on your business process. So it's either checking um, from the data you've uploaded so as a sort of drag and drop into the front end. So um, the data then is held against the contact and it's checking against that the format that you've approved for that. Um, alternatively, if you're using an API connection, then you're passing that data across at that point. It's just yeah. six steps. This is a very simple, um, the purpose of this part is just to engage people to get the IDMV and then bring them into the agents. Again, it's just sure. dependent on your business process. So, I mean, something that we also have clients do is that they have these IDMV bots that are actually just three or four steps and they have them available for the agents to send so that when the agent's managing the conversation, 
if they get to a point where they need to ID and V, and this could either be because the conversation's just got to a point where they need to disclose information, or it might even be that actually that conversation has now spanned three or four days and you're past your tolerance to accept the original ID and V that was completed. So the agent can then just trigger an ID and V, get that data confirmed again, get the ID and V completed, and then continue the conversation. Okay, really good. Really good. So um, moving on from there, um, so how um, do we bring in the natural language understanding and how do we incorporate that? So as people are putting sort of, um, you know, responses, uh, we all speak in a different way. We all would uh, respond in a slightly different way with different phrases or words or whatever used. How is the um, the Webio bots going to handle that in the real world? And then just show us, um, you know, how it, it, how it works, how it's trained, uh, and uh, could you give us um, an overview on that one? Yeah, certainly. So natural language understanding within Webio will really enable you to supercharge your bots, and as Mark was saying there, to, to take the customer's response that comes in and understand the intent of what they mean and then use that intent to take them down the, the relevant path for their journey. So it's very configurable. And if I just go into step one here, you can see this is, so it's, um, it's an intent gathering step. You can also look for entities. So an entity is where you're looking for a certain piece of information within a bot. Um, but today I'll just show you the intents. So this one is looking for just a yes no so are you available to chat to the team and just for demo purposes this is very simple you can use this to look for a lot more so you can use it to look for things such as vulnerability or financial difficulties you can even do it to look for things such as um, DSAR requests to ensure that you're, you're uh, meeting your GDPR compliance so there's lots and lots of possibilities here but um, you will configure your your natural language understanding agent, and then you set it live against a particular step in the bot that you're building. And similar to the way that we showed you earlier with the IDMV, you then use the intent that picked up out of that natural language understanding to route it through the conversation as required. And it's very, very easy to set up and very, very easy to train. So if I just show you this conversation here, so this is a yes, no bot that's being used, and it literally just looking for those intents and there's also a, a fallback intent there to handle anything that doesn't get matched against the yes or the no. And clicking into this one we can see so a lot of people are just replying yes and it's important to point out here this is actually live responses that have come in so it's not sort of pre-configured um, operational users responses. We can see it's also picked up things like I can, and it's picked up that as a yes. So that's where this is getting more powerful than your standard, your traditional keyword matching. But if, for instance, it had made a mistake at this point, and maybe this said I can't instead of I can, and it had tagged it as a yes, I can very easily just click into it and change it to the intent that I feel it should have been. I can click approve, and that will then go and train the bot. So the next time somebody sends that in, it will be a much more appropriate response. And you're not just training it for that specific response. It understands words and phrases around it. So um, a small amount of effort can get you a, a much bigger return. And how do you load them uh, uh, at the start daily? Do you have to map out um, a number of them or what would be the recommendation that you'd have there? So it's dependent on the the process flow that you're trying to build within your bot, but to load them. So perhaps what I've realized through this is that actually I also need a maybe intent. So to do that, I can just click create intent. Um, and then I will write down the name of the intent. And here I add in my training phrases. And this is where I want to add in two or three phrases that would just start the bot off. And then obviously it will get trained then with, with real data. So um, if I put in I, I might be, and you're not having to use entire sentences here, although you can do, you can just use parts of sentences or phrases and the bot will be able to pick it up from that. And uh, on average, how many of these training phrases would most clients uh, put in uh, before they go live? So I advise 
two to three training phrases on each intent. Mm -hmm. And it's down then to your own tolerance of how accurate you want it to be at the point of go live. So most clients will say, I want it to be 60 to 65 percent accurate at the point of go live. And you can get that quite easily just with your testing and your training. Now, you'll never be 100 percent when you go live because when you put it live into the real world, people will reply with things that you just did not expect or anticipate them to. So what we do advise is that that first week of go live, you're training the, the natural language understanding at least twice a day to say, this is what it's tagged as at, this is what it should have been. And then very quickly, you're getting up to much higher rates of accuracy. And within sort of a month, you should be around 85, 95% accurate. So you're getting very good accuracy very quickly. And then longer term, you'd be scaling back the training on the training on this so that you are training it maybe once a month. Um, so before we move on, uh, is there any other, because I'm looking at this now and one concern maybe that some people looking at this would be from a training point of view. Um, could you give us an overview um, of for sort of the training schedule to get somebody up to a level of where they're competent to, should we say, drive it on their own steam? What, what's what's uh, required there? So a typical onboarding would consist of, we would work with you quite closely in the requirements phase so that we understood exactly what you were trying to do with the bot, what ob objectives you were looking to meet with that bot. And we would also work quite closely with you in the content of that bot so that the language, the, the tone of voice, what it was saying, all the time sort of incorporating your, your brand ideas. The training itself is straightforward. You're looking about an hour for a super user training session. And then the way that I like to work is that we will do the first build for you, ideally with you shadowing that build so you can see it happening. And then the second bot that you want or the second iteration of the bot, you're taking over that. So you're doing that build and we're shadowing you. So we'll be on a screen share and we'll be able to sort of assist as needed. And we might do that for the next two or three bots until you're comfortable and you feel like you can sort of take ownership of that and run with it yourselves. But we are always on hand to assist. We can always um, you know, pick up the phone or, or jump on a call and just address any sort of um, training issues as they arise. But the training overhead isn't massive. In total, you are um, looking at around maybe four to five hours to be competent in, in building the bot and training the natural language understanding. Okay, so just before we move on, uh, because I think that was really useful just to show you the simplicity of it all and where, you know, there's no coding involved. It's all configurable. If I just draw your attention um, before we move on to the next piece, just on the left hand side of the screen there, there's all the different controls from reports, queues, conversations, campaigns. We're not going to go into them today, but all of these are there to give you that enterprise control um, and that configurability to absolutely meet your requirements right across the business, um, sort of regardless of the complexity of the many teams, even where they're situated, even globally where they're situated. And again, on a reporting point of view, great that you can do it all. There is a full reporting suite to be able to give you a deep dive analysis, both from quite a high level macro, all the way down to micro, even down to an agent level. So it's just worth noting uh, on that. Okay, uh, thanks for that. We're gonna hand over now to Graham. Uh, Graham, you're gonna walk us through a little bit more of a complexity where there was, um, a I think a little over 30 steps in total in the bot. This was in particular to do with um, the COVID-19 over the past um, uh, while. Um, so if I um, just start and, and move on there, uh, we've already seen uh, the bots in action. Uh, Graeme, could I ask you to take it from here? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah, again, this is a really good example of how quickly something can be done and how efficient it can be very quickly. And actually, th this is a standard um, schematic that we drew up for initially one customer, then the next customer came in, and the next customer came in, and, next, and they all came in with pretty much 90% the same requirement, you know, of how can we make sure, you know, we're covering the furlough, offering people holidays, and so forth. So let's have a very quick look at this on the screen. And you see, this is basically a, a simple 
outbound initiated conversation. First off, going out there and saying to people, look, you know, are you having trouble? Is COVID-19 affecting you? Um, you know, we, we're offering sort of payment holidays here. Do you need one or, or do you not? Again, the wording was quite key there just to make sure that everyone didn't just get the idea and go, uh, yes, um, please stop me having to pay money and don't put any interest on, you know. So again, very careful worked out very cleverly how we're going to get the most responses the way we want them to go. But again, that then would come back in from a response from the customer. The customers would respond in so many different ways. The first test we did, we got hundreds of different responses. It wasn't just a yes or a no. It was, yeah, this is affecting me in this way. My husband's currently ill, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this is where the NLP, the natural language understanding piece, came in very, very, very powerfully, very, very quickly. So we added that to the first stage of that bot. As you see there, it's looking for the yes or no's as the intents. That's basically what it's looking to do. Whether it's because your husband's in holiday, he's lost his job, again, that's a, a yes, I'm gonna need to help basically, as Delia was showing earlier on. So again, you go down those steps. Taking the yes step here, sort of following that sort of route, which is where the majority of people were going with this. You know, it's again, we're sorry to hear that. Um, you know, is there gonna be a reduction in income? Again, just to confirm. And what we're doing throughout the process then is also setting statuses of where that individual client is. So we know they've responded. So great, they've come in and they've said, yes, this is affecting them. So let's just log that somewhere so that can be pushed back into your ERP, CRM, your, your systems that you're using for your debt management. So you know that that was said, even if it goes no further, at least you'll know at that point, there's a status change on that customer. And for the next push that you do, very, very useful to make sure that you know, you're using the right wording again and you need the understanding. So let's keep moving through here. So we talked about IDMV. Obviously, a part of that was then to look at the IDMV process. Take that away from the agents. There was lots of responses to these. This was going out to thousands of people. And again, was it correct? Was it not correct? Again, I'm not going to detail on that. Deal has sort of shown how that works. And again, it would match against postcode for most people, match against an account number and so forth. And again, onto the next step. And you go through and through and through and through each time based on, again, the answers they're giving. Are they matching? And the important bit going towards the bottom of the screen here was actually they'd said, I'm having trouble. Again, still in full automation. They've been ID and feed, still in full automation. And the next piece is, okay, well, let's make some offers to them. Let's say, well, what can you afford? Can you afford nothing? Or actually, can you afford a reduced payment? So most people were offering that sort of A, B and C option. Um, and again, people would respond. And many people did respond with one of those options. And amazingly, a lot of people did go for the higher one, didn't always pick the low or the no. Um, and again, you know, again, that's how it's worded. That's how it's put out to them using that sort of natural language piece. So again, people would make that selection and they would go through that process again. Neural linguistics would be used where, where necessary. Again, not everyone replies A, B, and C. Not everyone says yes or no. So making sure the automation could do as much as possible before handing through to an agent. And then the last point, when something goes wrong or they put in, you know, I like blue as a color, which really didn't fit that conversation at all, then it would hand over to an agent. You see the circle around that piece there. That actually, in that whole journey of a, a good number of steps, is the only piece where an agent will come in. They only come in where necessary. Many of these people self-served and, and, and basically helped themselves and went through that whole process and gave the company what they need to know to be able to carry them, carry them on and through over the next few months. So very, very powerful. And that bot there, a little more complex than the, some of the bots that Delia showed just now. But again, that was built within a couple of hours and tested. And that's then available for people to use and share pretty much. You could build your own slightly different versions, but again, very powerful. But that automation piece, you can see a complex journey needed very quickly. The only piece where an agent is used is that tiny little corner there. So it's a really powerful, easy to use system that's gonna enable you to move forward very quickly. And as we said, you know, over three months, you can generally get up to 40% of your automation piece in there. And just one simple example. It really is, when you look at the picture, Graham, it's, it's telling that, you know, the tiny circle in the right hand bottom corner uh, and the rest is um, automated. Um, yeah. And the, the, what, the two hours? Uh, I know that there was one or two changes, um, but again, as we saw earlier when Delia was doing the examples, it is incredibly easy. So getting started on automation shouldn't be difficult. So again, the takeaway really from today um, would be, uh, as I say, we've seen the, the, the web of your bots in action, and really sort of from a, um, sort of the, the, the main bullet points, um, the whole, we're gonna start with just the, that connectivity and reach, getting to engage 
with people um, by conversational messaging, by layering down the, um, adding the automations and skills, huge efficiencies to be gained. We talked about the 42% reduction in agent and field agents, 40% um, of conversations being automated. So really that would be where, um, uh, and where it's going to add a huge amount. And then really for the, the, the final piece, which we're going to talk uh, a, a different, again, layering in extra sort of propensity and machine learning, uh, where it's going to guide the conversation to a better place. So that is a very quick, as I say, summary. Um, I'm going to hand over to Anne-Marie at this stage, because Anne-Marie, uh, I believe you have quite a number of questions. Let's see, within the time uh, of available. Can we get through a few of them at this stage? Okay, yeah. Thanks, William Mark. Yeah, let's fire ahead straight away. Um, the first question is, um, what channels can you have automation on? I'll take that, uh, Anne-Marie, um, and it's a very uh, simple uh, question, and um, really sort of any of the channels that you will want to operate on. If I was to look at the main channels today, you have SMS, WhatsApp, you're going to have RCS, you're going to have Apple Business Chat, Messenger, Viber, um, you're gonna be hearing more about Alexa and Google Home. So really, um, wherever you're having those type of digital conversations today, um, uh, it you know the, the whole automation piece uh, can be brought to bear there now the one really important thing um is you build it once within webio and that automation what we saw earlier in the webio bots that can be deployed over and over and over in all of the channels so you can build it once and deploy it multiple times in multiple channels okay great thanks William mark that actually um, has answered the second question which was can you use uh, one bot um, in a different channel, SMS or WhatsApp. So thanks for that. You've got a two for there. And the next one is um, automating the ID of these steps um, looks good, but our data is a little thin and varies, unfortunately. Um, how can we um, even use this? How could we, sorry, or can we even use this? I'll, I'll grab that one, Mark. It's um, it's it's, a, it's one we see, you know, <laughs> Some companies, you know, we work with, they, they've spent so much time and effort on their data, it's it's perfect, all bar one or two and a few numbers going out of date every so often. Others, yeah, it's, you know, it's purchased um, debt. Some of the data they get is pretty poor, very wholly, in fact, especially on DOBs and that sort of thing for uh, ID and V processes. So and that wasn't a do... religious reference, Graham, was it wholly? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't. <laughs> okay. But, uh, <laughs> fairly well pointed out, though. I'll uh, probably rephrase that next time. But um, <laughs> but what what you basically use the system for is 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 you try and automate what you can, but you also use the system to actually gather that information that you don't have, and that's what we see a lot of people starting to do. So you've got a lot of reports in there, and you've got this fallback process. Uh, so it's a learning thing, really. So you may send out that bot. It's looking to match a let's say just go to date of birth. That's one we used earlier on, and actually the date of birth doesn't match or there is no data birth to match against well all that's reportable you'll find all of that the journey for the customer isn't bad because we have those sort of you know there's foot failovers so no data birth match send it to an agent the agent can then capture that bit of data and post it straight into the system even the, the, the bot could do that the bot could say we can't match that against your file we don't seem to have one and it can capture that data birth and then post it back to you again to put back into your system so system can be used for many different things it's nothing to worry about not having great data and many people don't they definitely have holes here and there um, the system will not make the customer's journey worse for not having it but it will enable you to actually capture what you don't have and um, the next question which we we do get quite a lot and um, so it's not as uh, strange to see it popping up here now again and um, do customers know that they are engaging or talking to a bot we would always recommend that you would highlight that um, because what you will find is people will respond uh, slightly differently. They'll be a bit more, um, should we say, formal and structured in their responses. And it's always good practice um, that uh, it is a case where that we would, uh, would recommend that you make it um, apparent where appropriate. If you're just getting um, information like the date of birth and stuff like that, there's no real conversation going there. It's quite a binary. Uh, you've, you've given the right date of birth or not. It's when you start to get into the natural language and uh, it would be a case of where should you need to hand over to um, uh, an agent, certainly it makes it easier 
uh, if they know that you're uh, dealing with a bot now and that you're going to be handed over to an agent for whatever reason. So we certainly would recommend that. Great. Thanks a lot, Mark. And just quickly on to the next one. Um, for customers that just keep typing in random res responses, how does the system or bots handle that? Okay, yeah, it's, it's the same as really um, the journey we were talking about where it's not matching data. Um, the system will look for what you've trained it to understand. We talk about intents and the system understanding intents. Um, whereas, you know, you, you build those in, Delia showed a couple there, very simple, a yes intent, a no intent, and a maybe intent she added to that as well. You can add intents as you need them. And, and this comes down to really just looking back at the questions you've had. And if it's a repetitive question, it is a realistic question. You go, you know what, actually I get a lot of those come in. Let's let the system understand that and then manage it down the path of that that response. So that's very simple and easy. But when people, I think, probably referring to coming back with, yeah, you know, just 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 pure, just uh, rubbish, I guess. And we do see it. You, know, you may ask date of birth, and they'll come back with something completely random. Um, you know, it's just, yeah, I'm having a great day. Uh, but the question was, what's your date of birth? You know, um, well. The system's never going to know all of that stuff. Again, that's why the failover piece is always in there. The failover piece is in there, both in the natural language understanding piece and also in the Webio bot. So there's a, a double skin there to make sure the customer goes down the right path for them. You know, it could be a simple, sorry, I didn't understand that. Please, could you give me a date of birth? If that was the question. Um, some people don't ever want to ask again twice. Some do. I'd never recommend you ask more than twice because that's a really bad journey. Um, so again, all it will do is that pathway will say, no, didn't understand that. Send it to one of the agents that's currently available that works in that area. Again, depending on how you break that up. And they can then look at that, respond to it in a, in a human way. And if it's sort of uh, made any sense, that could be added and you could then improve the, the natural language understanding again using that. Or you would just go, no, this person's just talking rubbish. Um, let's work out why is there a vulnerability and whatever else in there. Great. Thanks, guys. Well, I'm just uh, noticing now we're coming up against the clock here. So we did have some additional questions, but don't worry, we will get back to you individually today. So um, just keep an eye out for that. And um, so I um, just want to say to everybody, thanks again for joining us here today. I hope that you found um, the session in, um, informative and insightful but um, if you do have any other questions or you'd like to learn a little bit more about how automation could work on the, at a, on the ground level in your organization or business don't hesitate to reach out to us there on the email info at webio.com i would be happy to give you advice on anything that you might need and um, so all that's left for me to do today is to thank you for joining us and hopefully as i always say we will see you again on another session uh, in the near future and um, have a great day everybody and thanks a lot Bye bye